Well, good evening. Um, it's, 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 it's very nice to be here. Did everybody get a handout on the way in? Yep, great. Um, so you'll see that the, the, the title on the handout is different from the, the title that I, I gave to Anthony. But in a way, that's the question. What are social groups? And social muriology is the correct answer to that question. So we, one way of thinking about the talk is I'm going to explain what I mean by social muriology um, and hopefully explain and persuade you that that is the, the right answer to the question, what are social groups? So when we think, um, I mean, there are many different disciplines that study society and study social groups in uh, different ways and in different levels. But when metaphysicians think about social groups, um, typically the starting point is this question about what's the relationship between the individual people in the group and the group as a whole. So here you are, here's an audience, right? So this, this is a group of people. Um, and there's each individual person in the room, or each of you is a member of the, of the audience, and there's the audience as a whole, and somehow you're the small things that make up the big thing, and the question is, what is that sort of making up relationship? What, how, how, what, 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 yeah, how, to, how to think about that relationship between the members of the group and the group itself? Um, so uh, the answer I'm going to advocate is that we should think about that in terms of parts and wholes. We should think of each of you as a part of one big physical, material, concrete thing which is filling up part of the space in this room. So you're parts of that whole. But other people have thought of it more in terms of sets. Um, we might say that, that each of you, that together you are the, the members of the set, which is the audience in, in the room. Sometimes people have tried to resist saying that there really is any one such thing as the audience. Sometimes people have said, well, this is just a plurality. There are many people here, a fair few people here, let's say. There's a plurality of people here. There's each of you, and there isn't some extra thing called the audience. And those are the views I want to resist, right? So I want to stick with this view that each of you is a part of this big thing called the, called the audience. So I mention audiences because I see an audience in front of me, but often when people talk and write about this in, in the philosophical literature, they talk about groups such as a committee. There's a lot of reference to university committees in, the, in, in philosophers' writings about, about social groups. Yeah. Or you might think of a book group, you know, a reading group, a band, you know, a music band or an orchestra. But a little bit differently, we might think of the population of a country or a city, um, a social class, um, um, a crowd. Sometimes often people talk about mobs, the mob on the street, and what sort of entity that is. And I've put that in a slightly different group because for some people, some philosophers have thought there's an important difference between something like a population or a crowd or a mob, which is just, in some sense, a bunch of individual people going around together, that some people have thought there's an important difference between that and as what we might think of as a more organised or more structured group, something like a committee or a book group or a band where the people sort of really work together and they may be following certain kinds of rules or have a common purpose and so on. I mean, I think obviously there are important differences between those different types of groups, but I'm going to say that for the underlying metaphysics, that's not important. In both cases, I want to think about things in terms of parts and wholes. So I'm calling this the muriological view because when we talk about parts and holes in, in metaphysics, often we, talk about, we think of that as muriology, as just terminology. Um, and this, looking back to see who else has advocated this view, because I'm certainly not the first, it seems to me this was more or less the default or the kind of the most popular view in the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. So there's some names on the hand out there, Quinton, Mellor, MacDonald and Pettit. <coughs> But people who were interested in this question at that time were mainly interested in it as a question within the philosophy of science and philosophy of social science. So, so there was a, a sort of methodological question about how to explain human behaviour or the behaviour of groups. Um, because we have individual psychologies, so for each individual person we've got the scientific study of, of how the individual works. And then we have the social sciences, such as, social, such as sociology, and perhaps political sciences, other, other, other science, social sciences, which study groups and try and understand group behaviour. And then there's a question about, well, how, how are we putting those different kinds of scientific understanding together? Or are they rival understandings, or are they both different aspects of the same thing? And I think with a bit of distance, and we can see that that's just an example of something that we often see in philosophy, where we've got different levels of reality, or different levels of a kind of organisation, and we've got different sciences that are studying things at these different levels, and then there's a question about how to put those different kinds of scientific knowledge together. So we have, uh, you know, we have biology, we have chemistry, we have biochemistry, we have physics, um, indeed we have psychology and we have physics and we have neuroscience, there's different, 
for many complex sorts of systems, there are different levels at which we can study it, and then we ask how we fit those things together. And that, I think, is the context for this, the, these debates in, during the 70s, as I say. But again, looking back into the literature, all of this, 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 this people advocating the myriological view, thinking about this in terms of parts and wholes, came to a kind of grinding halt in 1983 with a really nice paper by David Hillel Rubin, who raised various objections to this view, and everyone, as far as I can see, just accepted the objections and stopped, stopped advocating that view. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the points that Rubin made and perhaps why they, why they were um, effective at the time. And then there's a kind of 20-year gap in the literature, interestingly, where people don't focus much on this metaphysical question about the relationship between the members of the group and the group as a whole. Um, until, obviously with a few exceptions, but it's not, it's not widely discussed. Um, there's a paper by my, my colleague, Gabriele Uthquiano, in 2004, and then there's other names on the handout there as well, following on from Uthquiano, where he revives this question. He says, well, look, okay, if, if the members of the group are not parts of it, we don't think of this in terms of parts and wholes, how should we think about this metaphysical relationship? And Usquiano and some of those others there develop different views. So as I said, some people, sometimes people think of a social group as, as a set of the, of the members in it. Others will think of it as something, Usquiano in the end says that it's, it's sui genus, it's a special sort of metaphysical entity that doesn't have um, an analogue elsewhere in reality. Um, or there's the thought that it's, it's a plurality. Um, Ritchie, I think, says it's a, a, a social group as a kind of instantiation of a structure. So people are kind of... People talk about this part whole view, but only to say at the sort of the beginning of their paper, well, as we all know, Rubin said, showed that that was no good, so what can we have instead? But I think we should go back and we should, we should, we should uh, address Rubin's objections and revive this part whole view, the, the, the myriological view. Let me um, just give you a little bit of motivation for that, right, before I go on to... So, so the, kind of, the sort of central part of this talk will be telling you what, why people rejected this myriological view and why they were wrong to do it. At the end, I'll say why it's good to have the myriological view and what we can do with it. But let me just give you a little bit of that now as well, just a little bit of motivation for thinking of it that way. Um, and one way I think of motivating thinking about social groups in terms of parts and wholes is to slightly change the question. Right? So as I, as I, the first thing I have in the hand up there under introduction, I say, well, here's the question. What's the relationship between the group and the members of the group, the audience and the individual people sitting in the room? But we could ask a slightly different question, a, a way of getting at the same, the same sort of issue, would be to say, well, what sort of entity is the audience? Right? Is it concrete or abstract? Is it particular or is it universal? Um, is it something that persists in a certain way um, or is it momentary? There's lots of we can ask, first of all, start by asking questions about the audience or the, or the committee or the team or whatever it might be. And I think if we start there, it's a bit easier to see why it would be very, it would be um, attractive and useful to be able to think of a social group as a concrete object, a material object, right? Um, one is that if we think about the kind of properties that social groups can have, they can have important social properties, social roles, um, but also they have physical properties, right? So the room will be warming up because of the audience being in here. Um, together, I won't try and guess how much you weigh together, but together um, the audience has a certain significant weight that's putting pressure on the floor. You're occupying a certain amount of space. Now, you're, the audience isn't doing that sort of magically without the individual people doing it. Right? So I don't want to say that the audience is some kind of special thing that's separate from the individual people. But nevertheless, a, a group like an audience or a committee or a team has a physical reality as well as a social reality, we might say. Um, this is why committees like to have coffee and biscuits as well as, um, as, well as agendas. Uh, so a, a social group like an audience or a committee or a band or whatever it is it certainly seems to have physical properties as well as, as well as more sort of, in some sense, interestingly social properties. And whilst we can sort of give an explanation of how we might say that a set has a weight or that a set needs coffee and biscuits if it has a long meeting or something, that's going to be a bit fiddly, right? That's not, that's not the easiest way to explain why uh, a committee or an audience or something has, has physical aspects to it. Whereas if we think of, 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 of an audience as a big concrete object that weighs as much as each of you put together, that's, that's the, it's, it's, it's built into that picture of what a social group is, that a social group is going to have physical properties as well as, as more kind of interesting ones. And once we, if we, 
And the thing, in, in a way, sort of another version of that same point is to think about causation. Right? Social groups make things happen, sometimes intentionally, sometimes just by accident, right? if we cause the floor to collapse, if, if, there's, if there's too many of us. Um, obviously, a committee can make a decision that causes something to happen. Um, we can have a things, individuals and, and inanimate objects can have effects on social groups. So social groups are the kind of thing that are embedded in the causal network of the world. Um, and again, it's not that we can't give a story about how that might be sort of turn out to be in a way kind of true if a social group is some sort of abstract object. It's going to be a lot easier to do it, a lot more straightforward to do it, to understand how a social group can be the kind of thing that makes something happen or is acted on by something else if we can think of it as, an, as a physical object. Now, let me say, I don't want me to say that if we just take the, a social group to be a physical object, we magically solve all the problems and worries we might have had about causation between things at different levels of reality. No, those problems are still going to be there. But at least we can be able to understand how, if, if we think of a social group as a, a material thing, that's made up of smaller material things, uh, like, like each of us, at least we're in the right sort of ballpark for thinking about causation. So it's a good starting point. OK, so that, that's a little bit um, of a sort of rationale for thinking about social groups, or beginning to think about social groups in this way. And as I said, towards the end of the talk, in part C, um, I'll, I'll, I'll spell that out a little, a little bit more, so why I think it's, it's good to, to go this way. But let me do a little bit of um, sort of housekeeping or folk clearing now just to kind of tidy up a little bit what, what, how I'm going to be using terminology not to distract people. So, and the, the kind of cases I'm going to be thinking about. So I'm going to be focusing on social groups, I say social entities here, but I mean social groups which are made up of people. Some people think that you can, there can be social groups, something maybe like a university is composed of the people in the university, but also perhaps the buildings and the library and the labs and so on. It's a sort of mixed kind of entity. It's made up of people, but also um, furniture and buildings. That, I think that's an interesting suggestion, but I don't want to... That's too complicated for me today. I'm just going to think about groups like an audience or a committee that seem to be just made up of, of people and not also made up of, of furniture or buildings or equipment. Something else to be wary of is, and this is, I think, a, an obstacle to bringing this kind of metaphysics into constructive discussion with social scientists, um, uh, regrettably, which is that um, the, the use of words like group and organisation and collective and institution, I think, is really quite different between different disciplines. So philosophers, both in social metaphysics, but also when philosophers talk about group agency or social epistemology, many contexts in which uh, philosophers talk about people together, let's say, they'll use group as the general word. Whereas I think from a social science point of view, that a group sounds pretty thin in a way. Right? So from the point of view of, in the way the philosophers use the word, it makes sense to say that, for example, um, the Catholic Church is a group. Right? Well, it's from a kind of more social science point of view, or maybe a common sense point of view, because I mean, the Catholic Church isn't just a group of people, right? That's it, that's it, that's it, it's a much richer entity than that. Um, it's a, the thing of all the kind of the history and the norms and the, and the structures and so on. So there is. So if you're coming from outside of philosophy or from outside this part of philosophy and thinking, well, what do we mean by groups? Right? Well, typically, we mean all sorts of different kind of comings together of people, even if they're not the kind of thing that a, a sociologist might think of as a group. Um, so I'm going to stick with this kind of philosophical thing of saying group for all sorts of, of, of complicated things, although most of my examples are going to be fairly simple things like an audience or a, a, a committee or a team or a band. Then the third bullet point there, this is just for those of you who um, might be familiar with these terms. If you, if you haven't heard the term mimeology before, don't worry, because then you can't be distracted by what you previously thought it meant, so that's good. Um, if you had heard the term before, let me just say that I, by, by using the word mimeology here, I'm just indicating that I'm talking about parts and wholes rather than, for example, set membership. Um, I don't mean to bring in a whole load of um, uh, baggage that comes along with, for example, classical extensional mirology. Again, if you haven't heard of classical extensional mirology, that's good because you don't, have to, you don't have to bring that baggage with you. So, but that was just a kind of word for anyone who had. All right, one final thing before I start talking about Ruben's objections. Um, when I first started thinking about these issues, and I think the same is true for uh, many other people, you start thinking about sort of everyday examples, and it's very easy to get tangled up with the, the language that we use to talk about kind of group membership. Um, so when I started thinking, well, sure, can we think that the people are parts of the audience? 
I thought, well, no, we, we don't say audience parts, right? We say audience members, right? It would seem a bit, almost a bit rude to say that you're audience parts. Um, and we say committee members and book group members. So doesn't that already point us away from this kind of parthood idea towards something maybe more, it's more to do with collections or classes or sets where we talk about members? But when we think more about the, the way I think that we use ordinary language in this area, it's just completely a big mess, right? So even for someone who is relatively sympathetic to taking metaphysical lessons from ordinary language, I think this is not an area in which to try and do that too much with the differences between part and member. And it's partly because often we can use them interchangeably. If you think of someone as being part of your family or family member or they're one of the family, someone could be part of a team or a member of a team, there's not, you know, we don't, you know, we use it, just, we just use these words, I think, more or less interchangeably. So there's nothing too much to draw from that. We also, I think, use the word member, especially, it's interesting, in kind of commercial contexts where it's supposed to make you identify the brand, right, even though it's, you're not really a kind of part of it. So um, uh, in terms of Amex, American Express has card members, whereas Visa has card holders. I think maybe the card members thing is supposed to make you feel more identified with your American Express card. But there's nothing, the, the relationship between an Amex card holder and a Visa card holder and the, and the company with which they have their credit card doesn't seem to be different there, right? It's just, it's just sort of marketing speak. Um, Okay, and then there's the, there's the Star Wars reference on the handout as well. All right, so it's just a little kind of word of warning of not to read too much into whether you're tempted to say committee member or part of the committee. Um, okay, so now, so section B has how many parts? Four parts, um, which correspond to these four objections that people, I think they're all in Ruben, and they've been sort of developed and, and uh, recapitulated in various ways by other authors more recently. And the these are the four reasons, I think, why people have rejected this mirrorological view. They've said it just doesn't make sense to think of the people in the audience as parts of the audience, or the, the members of the committee as parts of the committee. And I think they're all mistaken. And they're mistaken um, in kind of thematic ways, and I'll come back to that a bit later on in the talk. So well, why, I think, why, why were these sort of similar kinds of mistakes made? Um, how, can we, how can we avoid that sort of mistakes in thinking? So here's, um, here's the first one. I'll, I'll just deal with this quite quickly. So people have sometimes thought, well, look, if I'm saying that the audience is, the, is, is composed, that you are all the parts of the audience, and together you make up the audience, and it's a part-whole relationship, what if somebody leaves, right? Doesn't that just, just destroy the audience, right? If the audience just is the people that make it up, then if, if Lucy walks out of the door, she's sitting near the door and she escapes, um, then doesn't that mean that the audience isn't here anymore, isn't wholly here anymore? Um, and then people have thought, well, look, but that's not how we think about audiences. Right? An audience can get a bit bigger and a bit smaller. I mean, maybe if 99% if of you leave, then the audience is gone. But there's a bit of flexibility there. Different people can come and go. Different people could have been here as well. There's a modal flexibility as well. There could have been different people here. There could have been fewer people here, more people here, and so on. Um, and surely that's right. I mean, that's often true with committees or teams or crowds and all of these other, all of these other kind of social entities. Um, typically, there's a kind of flexibility in their membership, who might have been here and who's, who's in it at different times. And that's fine. But that, I mean, I think it's just a mistake to, meet, to think that that means that the relationship between the people who happen, who happen to be in the audience right now and the audience itself is not... So I've got my luck with how many negatives I have in that sentence. Um, one can accept that flexibility while still accepting that this is a parthood relation. Let me put it that way. Right. How do we know that? Well, because we know, you know, I'm standing here and I'm, I'm speaking and I'm, I'm, I'm breathing in and breathing out, so I'm changing my own parts, right? Many, many composite objects change their parts over time, and if I had, had something different for lunch, I would have had slightly different parts now, and modally flexible as well. We're used to the idea that things can be composite, things can have, be made of parts, and at the same time, it can be true that they can be made of somewhat different parts at different times and in different possible worlds. They could have been made of different parts. Now, how is that? Why? I mean, there are metaphysical puzzles there, right? About how is it that things can change their parts? How best should we think about, about the world that, ma that makes that the case? And that's something I've talked about in other contexts. And on the handout there, I've, you know, I just kind of listed some of the philosophical views that sometimes people have adopted in order to explain that. But in a way, it doesn't really matter which way you explain it. Um, I just want to remind you that we're completely used to the idea that things can be parts of a whole, even though that whole could have had different parts or maybe has different parts at different times. Right? This sort of flexibility and changingness to do with membership 
um, does not mean that we're not talking about parts and holes. And whatever we say about the way in which I'm changing my parts by, you know, inhaling and exhaling um, uh, is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to work for this case as well. So I'm just going to pass quite... I mean, again, obviously, I'm happy to talk about this in, in discussion if people want to raise further questions, but I'm going to move on because in the, 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 other, the other objections to the view here, I think, are more interestingly connected to social groups rather than other kinds of, of, of composite objects. So here's an objection that is often raised uh, to do with the transitivity of parties. So again, this is an objection to the idea that the, the members of a group are just literally parts of it. Um, and this is often raised in the context of thinking about the US Supreme Court, but I think we've probably had enough of all of that for a little while, so I've put in my favourite band, Duran Duran. All right. So Simon Le Bon is a member of Duran Duran. This is still true. Um, now... Uh, I say then that he's that Duran Duran is a large composite object that has Simon Le Bon as one of its parts, um, and I accept uh, that Simon Le Bon has parts of his own, including his nose. Let's say, well, then says the objector to me, well, then surely you're saying that Simon Le Bon's nose is is a member of Duran Duran as well, right? Because Simon Le Bon is a part of. I'm, I say he's a part of the band, but there's all these other parts as well, right? and that seems problematic. Um, and because, yeah, because, tra yeah, and the thought is, well, that's, that's because part of it is transitive. So if the nose is part of Simon and Simon's part of the band, then the nose is part of the band as well. And people don't like that conclusion. So one thing I could do here is say, well, let's give up on the transitivity of part of it. That's a, that's a, that would be a big, a big thing to do and, and unnecessary. So instead, what I want to do is push back on the idea that this is problematic in any way. Right, so I'm going to say that Simon Le Bon's nose is part of Duran Duran, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a sort of reductio of what I want to say. So let, let's try and think about why anyone might have thought that was problematic. Um, uh, so I suppose, yes, yeah, so Ruben has this, raises this objection, but all those other names, those Osquiano and Effingham and Epstein, all, they all raise the same objection. And sometimes they say, well, look... Uh, we, we can just, you know, it's obvious that the, 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 the nose isn't, isn't a member of the band, right? There are only four members of Duran Duran, and they're all sort of human being shaped. None of them are nose shaped or arm shaped or whatever. Um, and that's right. Okay, so I want, I want to accept that. Um, it is obvious that Simon Le Bon's nose is not a member of Duran Duran. But is it obvious that it's not a part? I think this, this, I mean, it's hard not to say that. This doesn't seem obvious. I mean, it's like a sort of theoretical question that isn't a sort of common sense matter. I mean, if I said how many noses are parts of Duran Duran, I mean, you might kind of look at me a bit strangely, but four would be a slightly more plausible answer than zero, I think. I mean, this, this, this just doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that we should have intuitions and common sense about. So, so I want to say it's not just obvious that um, the nose is not part of the band. But that's not the only thing that these, these authors say. They don't just say, well, obviously this is true. Right? They come, um, Effingham in particular really sort of spells out nicely why we should be concerned about this. And the, the gist of it is this. Um, you might think, well, look, we can see that um, the, the singer, Simon Le Bon, has a special role to play in the band that the nose itself doesn't. Right? So he has, a, he has to do the singing, but also presumably gets a writer's credit and he gets a share of the royalties and so on. When they talk about this in terms of the Supreme Court, you know, the, Supreme, the, the judges on the court have a special role that their arms don't have. Right? There's a, something distinct, there's a distinctive... Um, powers and duties and responsibilities that come along with being a member of the Supreme Court, not just, not just being an arm of a member of the Supreme Court. And likewise, although less uh, uh, consequentially that, uh, for Duran Duran. So clearly there's a difference there between Simon Le Bon, the man, and his nose. There's a difference between the judge and the judge's arm. But what I want to resist is that that's a difference that should be spelt out by a metaphysical theory and explained. Right? What I want to say is, well, look, that's, that's fine, but if you want to know what's special about the justices on the Supreme Court, you don't ask a metaphysician, you ask a constitutional lawyer. And there's going to be different answers for different sorts of social groups. So let me spell this out a little bit. Um, so that's my no. Right? So they, uh, Effingham is asking someone like me to provide within my metaphysical theory an account of the difference between Simon Le Bon's relationship to Duran Duran and his nose, his relationship to Duran Duran, and I'm saying, no, that's not the job for metaphysics. Okay. Let me give you um, an analogy. Um, 
Um, so, uh, um, consider my dog, so I didn't bring my dog, but it's, suppose I had a dog here, and um, the dog would have many parts, and amongst the dog's parts would be organs, its liver and its heart and so on, and also molecules, right? and some of the molecules would also be parts of the organs, and some of them wouldn't, and you know, so on. So we've got a dog there with many parts. Um, and we all, I think, most unless you've got a really quite unusual metaphysical view, you're, you're, just, you're not even going to um, think twice about assuming that the organs are parts of the dog and the molecules are parts of the dog. That's a kind of paradigm case of parthood, that, that sort of thing, part whole relations. But the organs are special sorts of parts, right? Well, the role of the organs in the dog is different from the role of the molecules in the dog. Um, uh, surely that's true. But what, what is it? What, 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 what's special about the organs compared to the molecules? Well, I want to say, don't ask me. Go and ask a dog physiologist. Right? Or go and ask a biologist. Um, uh, I mean, maybe a bit of philosophy of biology might help bring out some of the things there, but it doesn't seem to be a job for the, a general metaphysician of composite objects to explain the difference between organs and molecules and their different role in dog physiology. Um, same thing if you had a, a Lego model, so um, made of a bunch of bricks, right? So a Lego model has bricks, individual bricks as parts. So I really could have brought an official example. Um, it has individual bricks as parts. It also has individual molecules as parts. And it's important if you want to play with Lego, you need to understand that there's a difference between the molecules and the bricks and how you can play with them and fit them together and move them around and so on and indeed see them. Um, but again, Although the, the individual bricks play a, or have a, are parts which play a special role in the, in the model, different from the role played by the other parts, which are molecules, again, we don't ask the metaphysician to give a sort of deep difference between the relationship between the, the blocks in the whole and the molecules in the whole. All right, so what I'm trying to do here is to resist being given this job as a metaphysician um, or as a as someone who's trying to provide a general metaphysical theory of what social groups are. I don't mean to say that there's no philosophical questions here about Lego. I think there's, there's interesting issues we might raise, and certainly there's, there are issues in philosophy of biology, and we might think about organs and so on. But if in general we want to know is the, what, what's the relationship between the, the people in the group and the, and the group as a whole, um, and I want to say that's parthood rather than, for example, set membership, I think that's enough. Right? I don't think that there's something else here that I have to answer. Well, how you might think that's that's a, that's a bit that's a bit vague, right? So if um, how are we going to find? So it's one thing to say with a, with a, with a dog, then we should turn to a physiologist or a biologist. Um, but in general, how are we going to find out what what is the special role? Um, uh, so, if we, if so remember what I'm saying here is that a social group is a big concrete object um, made up of human beings, um, and the human beings are parts of the concrete of the, of the group. But also, the parts of the human beings are parts of the group, and so on. And now the, there's this question coming back about well, what's special about the human beings then? One thought we might have is that well, it's actually that they're human beings. Right? That that's what makes so. It's only human beings that can really be members of social groups. So even if the the even if my arm is um, a part of the university because I'm part of the university, still I can't be a member of the university because or I sorry, I am a member of the university, but my arm isn't because I'm a human being. But actually, Ruben himself brings up that this issue. Um, that can't quite be right because often organisations have institutional members as well as individual members. Um, and if we want to understand how that's possible, again, we don't talk to a metaphysician. We look at the formal rules of the organisation. So actually, the Institute of Philosophy here in London is quite a nice example. So the Institute of Philosophy has individual members. And individual people can join up. Um, and it also has individual members. It also has institutional members, I'm sorry. So for often, philosophy, a philosophy department in a UK university can itself be a member of the Institute of Philosophy. So you've got these different categories of member, different types of member. Um, and I want to say that, well, so my, so I'm not, I don't have a personal membership of the Institute of Philosophy, but my department, the Department of Philosophy at the University of St. Andrews, does have institutional membership of, of the Institute of Philosophy. So what's that going to look like on my picture? So I say the Institute of Philosophy is a big concrete object made up of all these different philosophers. Um, I'm committed there to saying, well, I'm a part of that, even though I'm not a member, because I'm a part of my department, 
And my department is a member of the Institute of Philosophy, so it's a part of it on my view. So I'm a part of the Institute of Philosophy, I'm, but I'm not a member of it, right, because I didn't join as an individual. But, you know, I had to find that out. So I had to check whether I was a member of the Institute of Philosophy by going on the website and looking at the Constitution and finding out whether members of institutional members are themselves members of the Institute of Philosophy. And the answer is no. Um, my point there is not to make a point about the Institute of Philosophy. My point is that when we want to find out these, establish these, um, you know, answer questions like whether an individual person is a member of, of a group despite being part of it or not, we don't try and do it through a priori metaphysics. We do it by going and looking at the formal rules of the organisation or its constitution or whatever it might be. Okay, um, so that's... That's the, the, the conclusion of the section got slid onto the, the very top of the, of the second page. So here is, my, here is my response to this transitivity of partial argument. Um, the argument is that um, uh, we shouldn't think of um, Simon Le Bon as part of Duran Duran, literally part of it, because then we won't be able to tell the difference between Simon Le Bon and his nose, in some sense, because they'll just all be parts of, of Duran Duran. And my response is that's... that's we, we don't have to find a difference between Simon Le Bon and Simon Le Bon's nose in our metaphysical account of social groups. Right? We can say, yes, these are all parts. Some different parts have different roles. Um, some part, in that context, some parts get, uh, share the royalties and some parts don't on the Supreme Court, you know, part of, some parts of the Supreme Court get to judge, get to vote, rather others don't. Um, but that is just like the way in which the dog has many parts, and some of those parts are organs, and so they're special in some sense, but they're still just parts, they're just a special kind of part. Okay, so here's a different sort of objection. This is the third of the fourth objections that are sometimes raised against the myriological view of social groups. Um, and Again, there's this list of authors there. Um, I, I, want to, I, keep, I keep putting the names up because I want to sort of emphasise to you the way in which I, it's not a huge literature, but there's a kind of there's a sort of there is a literature here, and it's 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 really very much been guided, I think, by these very influential objections that that Rubin came up with, and other people have taken them up and used them as a, a, a reason to have to try and find some other some kind of non mirological view to, to advocate. Okay, so what are co-extensional groups? Well, these are groups that have, seem, to have, seem to be two different groups with the same members. Um, so if you, uh, again, philosophers often use university philosophy departments as examples in, in, their, in their metaphysics. So if you work in a small department or a department where there's lots of people but only a few of them do all the work, you may have an undergraduate studies committee and a postgraduate studies committee, and it's just the same people who end up serving on both committees. Um, or Rubin has an example where it's a family and they form a circus troupe. So you've got the family and you've got the circus troupe. It's the same people, but they seem to be two different groups. Uh, Epstein says the Massachusetts Department of Transport Board is the same people as, I should have written this down, as the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority Board. So they're two different kind of committees or boards. They have different powers, but they have the same membership. Um, and there's lots of different examples like that. Uh, so some of these examples are going to be ones, I think the, the Massachusetts thing, it's, it's sort of ex officio, right? It's kind of written into the way these things set up that it's going to have the same people on it. Other times it might just be a coincidence. Maybe at a school you have a chess club and a nature club and it just happens it's the same people that join both clubs. Um, so sometimes it's going to be sort of, uh, they seem to be necessarily co extensional we might say. Other times it's just going to be an accident. Well... Why is that a problem um, for the myriological view? Well, it would be a problem. This, this is the point at which, um, so until now, I've been trying to hold off, and I said, well, I'm just talking about parts and holes. I'm not making any sort of specific commitments about how parts come together to make holes or what sort of principles or sort of logical system we might use to think about that. This is a point in which we might want to start asking a few more detailed questions about exactly what do I want to say about parts and holes. Um, so I'm going to give you some different options here. Um, we've got... If, if I want to say... If I want to say that two objects which have the same parts are just really one and the same object, 
then it seems like I've got a problem here, right? Because I've got these two committees, the Undergraduate Studies Committee and the Postgraduate Studies Committee. I say they're just concrete objects that are made of their parts, but they have the same parts, so surely aren't they just really one and the same thing? What's happened to the idea that we had two different committees here? So, either what I... So, right, so, sorry, I've kind of tangled this around a little bit. So there's two options for someone like me here, right? So one is to say, well, yeah, they really are two different... They really are the same object, right? They've maybe got two different names for them, or they seem to be two things. There's a sort of bullet-biting response here where I say, well, really, this is, this is just one and the same object. We're under two different guises or two different names or something like that. So that would be one option. A different option um, is to say, well... OK, look, these, are two, these two committees are two different objects in the world, or these two, you know, the chess club and the nature club are two different things. Um, if I want to hang on to the idea that nevertheless they have their members as parts, I'm going to have to come up with a bit more of a kind of sophisticated story about parthood, which explains how come um, two different objects can be made of the same parts. So there's two, there's, two, there's two ways I can go here. One is just to say, oh, it really just is one, one and the same object. They just look like two different things. The other one is to say, well, no, there's, there really are two objects here, but that's compatible with saying that the members are parts of them. Um, I kind of realised, I was thinking again on my handout on the train, I, I, I kind of go back and forth a little bit. The handout isn't as clearly laid out here as, as, I, as I might have hoped. Um, but, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you in a way which I hope is, is better laid out, and we'll see how it fits with the handout. Um, uh, the, 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 the option of saying that the two committees, the Undergraduate Studies Committee and the Postgraduate Studies Committee, are in fact two different things, and nevertheless they're made of the same parts. We might say that's a kind of non-extensional muriology. We have a story about parts and wholes that makes that possible. Some people, so that's, that's I think, is what Epstein is, is doing in his, his nice book, which is called The Ant Trap. He sort of explores these ideas that, you, that the two boards, the two committees, the two teams um, can be distinct objects, different objects, even though they have the same members, and even though the members are parts. Um, so I, I don't want to pursue that, because um, partly because Epstein does it, and that's, he, does, he does a nice job. So if that's the way you want to go, I recommend doing what he wants to do. Rather, what I'm going to explore now is the, is the sort of more bullet-biting response, we might think. This is the response where I say, well, look, it seems like it's two committees. Well, it's, these committees seem to be two different entities, but really it's just one and the same thing because they're made of the same people. All right, and what I want to suggest is that... Um, right, so then, then, then the difficulty for me, the reason this is a sort of bullet-biting response, the reason this might look problematic is you're going to say, well, look, hang on, the, you know, the Undergraduate co Studies Committee meets on Mondays, and the Postgraduate Committee doesn't meet on Mondays, it meets on Tuesdays. These committees have different properties. They have different powers. They discuss different matters. Um, you might think that um, uh, the family and the circus troupe, likewise, are going to have different features, or they're going to kind of meet at different times, perhaps. The Nature Club perhaps meets on one day, and the Chess Club meets on another day. How can I say that these are one and the same object when they seem to differ in all these ways? There's a problem here from Leibniz's law. Uh, Leibniz's law tells us that... Um, I never get this right way around. Uh, Leibniz's law that, that, that's relevant here will tell us that if, if things are identical, if it's really just one and the same thing, then any property the one thing has, the other one has to have as well. You can't have one and the same thing having different properties from itself, as it were. All right, so that's the challenge here. Right? If I want to say that the two committees are really just one object... How am I going to explain the way that it seems um, that they have different features? Because one meets on Mondays and the other one doesn't. One gives the undergraduate degree results and the other one doesn't. Well, this um, is, although it, in the literature it looks like a kind of special problem about groups and collectiveness and bringing people together into committees and teams and so on, it's really not, in my view. Like, this is just the same problem that we have um, often in an individual case. All right, so remember, the, the view I'm trying to hang on to is the idea that a committee is a concrete object that's made up of its members, um, and that's the case even when it seems like you've got two different committees. It really it's just one and the same. I want to suggest that this is really just the exact same situation as you had here in London in 2015. Um, when you have Boris Johnson being both Mayor of London and the MP for, uh, I couldn't put it on my hand, but I think it's actually Oxbridge and West Ryslip, um, 
So you, there's one person, right? There's just one guy there. Um, and he had two importantly different social roles. Um, and as mayor, he could do certain things um, and shouldn't have done other things. And as MP, he had other kinds of responsibilities and powers and so on. Um, and this, it's true that there is something puzzling there. There is something kind of well, puzzling, politically puzzling maybe, but also philosophically puzzling about what's, what's kind of going on metaphysically when we think about that kind of situation. So there's just the one person there, right? Um, and we can attribute to him physical properties. We can say where he is on a given day. We can say how much he weighs and how tall he is and all those sorts of things. We can say that the mayor, you know, the mayor is driving down Whitehall or something. We can talk about him and attribute these physical properties. Same thing for the MP. We don't want to say that there's Boris Johnson and there's another different physical object, which is the mayor, and a different physical object, which is the MP, and they're somehow they're all going around together. That would, that would not be what we would be inclined to say, I think, in that case. We do have some harder questions, to this, and this is, I think, where you know, there's a very rich literature in, in social metaphysics that isn't specifically about social groups, but it's more about how do, how is the social world generated from our sort of actions and intentions and structures and norms and, and conventions and so on? How do people get to, you know, what is it to have, a, what is a social role, like be, being the mayor of London? And I think those, all, none of those questions, I'm not trying to deal with those questions here, right? I think those questions still stand. Um, but when we're thinking about just the, in some sense the kind of basic metaphysics of what sort of entities have we got going around the place here, we've got one, in the case of the mayor, in the case of Boris Johnson, we've got one the same material object somehow playing these different roles. Right. And I think that's the model that we should use for the committee as well. So if you've got the same poor three people who have to sit on both committees, um, well, the sum of those people is... It's, it's the undergraduate committee and it's the postgraduate committee that they have to do all the work. Um, and it's that, I mean, in some sense, that's mysterious. Like how can one and the same thing have these two different roles? It can have the role of being the undergraduate committee and it can have the somewhat different role of being the postgraduate committee. But I think that really is the, it's the same issue as we have when we have a, a single human being who's both mayor and, and MP at the same time. So that's by way of saying this isn't a special problem about social groups. I think this is a problem about, or an issue, a question about social entities. And I think that's, a, that's I'll come back to that a bit later on. I think that's a, that's a good lesson to learn from this literature more generally, that sometimes I think we've thought that there's a special problem here about collecti collectivity or plurals or bringing people together in groups, whereas really the, the kind of metaphysical challenges are coming from things having social roles or social natures or social properties, whether it's just one person at a time or whether it's a group of people. Well, but you might say, well, hang on, what about that Leibniz law thing? Right? So how come, right, so now we've just got a, now we're just feeling puzzled about Boris Johnson as well as feeling puzzled about the committee. This isn't really much an advance. How can it be that one and the same thing is both the undergraduate committee and the postgraduate committee, it meets on Mondays and it doesn't meet on Mondays? How can that just be one entity? Well, uh, th there are, if any of you are familiar with literature about, endless literature about statues and lumps, there's a whole load of kind of things that people say about statues and lumps of clay there. But if you're not, um, let me just give you the kind of solution that I like here. I mean, I think a good way of thinking about that is to say, well, it's not that there's just a single property of meeting on Mondays that this committee, this, this, this concrete object kind of has and doesn't have. Rather, we need to be a bit more careful and say, well, there's a property of meeting on Monday as the undergraduate committee or to do the undergraduate studies business. And there's a different property of meeting on Mondays to do postgraduate studies business that it doesn't have, right? There's no sort of conflict. So they've got the committee. It took like the sort of common sense way of describing the example is to say, this, the undergraduate committee meets on Mondays, the postgraduate committee doesn't. What I want to say is there's one thing there, and it's, it's meeting on Mondays to deal with undergraduate business, and it's not meeting on Mondays to deal with postgraduate business. There's no one property that it has and lacks at the same time. So this is sometimes called a predicate shift strategy when people talk about this kind of thing for individual objects. Right, so it's a way of sort of refining what, we, what, what kind of properties we want to attribute to these things. So there's a, there's a reason that works just as a sort of fiddly response to Leibniz's law, but I think it's not just a kind of get out. Because I think particularly, even if you didn't like this kind of predicate shift idea elsewhere, I think we're actually very familiar with this thought in the social world, right? We do things, you know, as, you know, if I... Um, um, 
if I had, had well, as, as is true, right? so I have people that I work with who are my friends, or some of my friends and my colleagues, and if we're discussing things, I might say, well, I, we, I might speak to them as a colleague, or I might speak to them as a friend. Um, you can, um, as, as, as you see with Boris Johnson, right, he can attend one meeting as mayor and attend a different meeting as MP, or he might attend a different meeting as a private citizen or as a member of the Conservative Party. We, we have this the idea of kind of attending as or acting as or speaking as is just really kind of ubiquitous in, in, in the social world, which is not to say that it's a philosophically unproblematic. Right? I think we're, there are good questions about how does that work. And in practical terms, sometimes there are grey areas, and this is how we get confusions. Right? Am I speaking as a colleague or am I speaking as a friend? Is he at this meeting as a private citizen or as, as mayor? Right? That, I mean, there are in reality indeterminacies and grey areas here that I don't want to sort of wash away. But nevertheless, there are grey areas there because we're also familiar with the idea that there, there are also kind of clear black and white cases. OK, so let me, let me, let me summarise the, my line of argument here. Um, what I'm saying is that, um, first of all, there's no special problem here about... Um, groups as opposed to individuals, right? There's a, there is an issue here about how one and the same entity can have two different social roles, um, and um, that's an interesting question, and my view is that the reason we don't get contradictions here is that we can be a bit more subtle about the, the properties that we're attributing to things. We can think of someone as meeting as a certain committee and not meeting as another committee. Um, you might be tempted, uh, I, I put the suggestion on the handout, so sometimes I think it's a natural thought here is to say, well, Really, the mayor is some kind of abstract role, right? or the MP, the MP is an abstract thing. It's, it's a kind of mistake to think of a mayor as being something that can be six foot tall and weigh 100 kilograms or whatever he weighs. Um, I mean, you can go that way, right? And then we might think, well, the committee, likewise, is a kind of role that is played by this concrete object or something like that. The reason I don't want to go that way, I mean, I think one could make sense of that, right? The, the, just, the reason I'm, that's not attractive to me is partly, I think this will just spin out of control, so, right, so not spin out of control, it sounds a bit dramatic, but there's just going to be many examples like this. So I, so I remember I said I can, I, I can speak to someone as, as a friend or as a colleague, but I don't want to think of them. The, the friend isn't abstract. I mean, there is the role of being the friend, the role of being the colleague, but the friend is, I'm, I'm the friend, right? It's the role, the abstract thing isn't the friend. So there's going to be too many abstract objects knocking around if we go this way, in my view. Um, and I think it's just not necessary. We can, we can deal with this stuff without having to say that um, you know the, the, an abstract object makes budget decisions and speaks in the House of Commons and that sort of thing. OK, but really, the, key, the, the main, the, the, if you only take one thing from that section, it's the last sentence there on the handout. No special problem about groups as opposed to individuals. So the fourth and final objection, um, uh, also raised by Rubin um, and picked up in different ways by Quiano and, and Frank Hendricks, and this is something, a distinctive problem about location. So Ruben says, well, especially for, perhaps not for something like a, just a crowd or an audience, but for more complex groups, like an organisation, as he puts it, um, uh, like the International Red Cross is his example. He says, well, look, we can't identify the International Red Cross with the people that in some sense make it up because it can be in a different place from them, in both ways, right? So first of all, if one of the, the core team from the International Red Cross goes on holiday in, in Barbados, that doesn't automatically mean that the, the Red Cross is in Barbados, right? so he says. Um, and so that's an example of a member of the, of the organisation being somewhere without the organisation being located there. And vice versa, so if they all have a whole long day's work and then they all go home and the headquarters of the Red Cross is empty at midnight, Ruben wants to say, well, the, 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 that's still that's the location of the International Red Cross is in its headquarters, even though there's nobody there. Right? So the, 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 the organisation can be somewhere where the people aren't, and the people can be places where the organisation aren't. So this is a sort of special case of a, diff a seeming difference in properties between the group or the organisation and the sum of the people who, who, who in some way make up the organisation. And again, in some ways, my, my answer here is analogous to the answer I gave in section three. Um, I want to say that there's no distinctive problem about groups here. Right? This is actually, if we think about it, this is something we're familiar with in, um, in individual cases. So each of us, so here's my physical location right now, here I am. 
I'm in London. Um, but also, I have, um, I'm, for tax purposes, I'm located in Scotland. Right? This is, they, they just changed the tax law yesterday. So the income tax now is going to be different in Scotland than it is in, in England. And I could escape that by moving, uh, you know, moving permanently back to England. Um, but just the mere fact that I'm here now physically doesn't mean that I, doesn't mean that I get to pay my taxes here today. All right. And the many, so each of you will be registered somewhere to vote, and it's probably not the constituency that you're in physically in right now. Um, so we have locations for, yeah, for tax purposes, for, for voting, school catchment areas, right, it's a big deal, where you, where, where, the, where you live and where, where your kids get to go to school. Um, so we have what we might think of as a range of sort of official locations or legal, loca or kind of locations for certain purposes, right? And often these things are supposed to be somewhat correlated with um, our physical locations or our, our predominant physical... Like, so, like I said, if I permanently moved back to England, then I wouldn't be under the Scottish tax regime. Um, um, so there's the, and where you vote has to be connected to where you habitually live. Well, yeah, there's there's going to be some connection there, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not a sort of lockstep thing. And I think that's, that's just what we're seeing with these organisations, right? There's going to be something like a physical location, which is where the sum of the people are. And then there's going to be, well, where can the, where can the organisation, where is it legally registered? Where does it pay tax if it pays tax? Um, where can it act, right? But, and where, there's different ways of acting, right? The, um, uh, you know, which, which sort of legal regime does it operate under and so on? And these might be different. Right? And you can be, you can be liable for tax in more than one place. Uh, you can be... Maybe should, uh, sometimes people end up being able to vote in more than one place if you're an expat and so on. So again, I want to suggest that this is actually something we've, so we've got what's been thought of as a problem about social groups is just a kind of phenomenon of the social realm that applies equally as much, or equally as much, but um, certainly applies extensively to individuals as well as to groups or to, to organisations. But interestingly, like, we don't, we're not tempted... Um, so although, you know, I, 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 I uh, yeah, I vote in Fife, and, but here I am, so, um, my, so, my, so I've got, I stand in a relationship to Fife, which is something to do with, like, it's a relationship like being registered to vote in or something. Um, it's sort of obvious to us metaphysically that that's, that's you know, I stand in, what, right now I'm standing in a certain relation to the central London, I'm standing in a different relation to Fife, which allows me to, to vote there and requires me to pay tax there. We don't, we don't, doesn't occur to us to think, well, there's a physical Catherine and then there's a kind of taxpayer Catherine and a voter Catherine that are up in Fife right now. Right? We, we recognise that these are different relations that one person stands in, one physical person stands in, rather than sort of somehow different manifestations. But for some reason it seemed more obvious, I think, to people, not just Rubens but to others as well, that because there's a sort of official location for the organisation, and there's also the kind of physical location of the people, those things must be different, two different entities rather than being two different relations. Um, uh, I've got some speculations about why, why, why these things seem different in the individual and social case, but, and, and, and plural case, but I'll, I'll, maybe you can ask me about that if you're interested. Okay. Um, so, though you have to take my word for it that there aren't any other worthwhile objections. Um, but there aren't. I uh, know. These are certainly the key ones that people have often come back to. Um, and I think all, they are all problematic in different ways, um, or at least they're certainly resistible. Um, and I think we've seen a couple of patterns, right? So there's different things, and there's different ways of responding to these objections, and different issues come up. But one thing that's been a kind of common theme is that. Um, often something has seemed like it's been a sort of obvious problem, it's been taken to be a problem that's come about because of difficulties in understanding how people can kind of collectively be together in some kind of larger entity, whether that's a plurality or a, 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 um, a set or, or a sum or something. And actually the mistake is to think that that's where the philosophical challenges come from. Really, the, the philosophical, the, the, where we've seen difficult questions, they've really been about how do entities get social status, whether, and often it can be an individual, how does it get to be a voter or to be mayor or whatever it might be. That's the, it's the same kind of question that we have to ask in, in, the, in the collective case. How does a, just a bunch of people stuck together, how do they get to have social status and so on? That, these are good questions, but it's in some sense the same question. So that's one thing that's come through. Something I haven't emphasised so much today, which I, but I think is true, is sometimes these... 
I, I mean, this is just a kind of timing issue, right? So, I mean, Truven's paper is really terrific, but it, it's, it's written before sort of endless amounts of other people writing endlessly about parts and whole and working out different views about composition and statues and lumps and so on. And I think sometimes the objections to this mirological view of social groups depend on assumptions about what parts and wholes have to be that we, that we don't have to accept. Okay, so having said all of that, let me just briefly say um, one or two things about why, not just that we can hold a mirrorological view because these objections are not powerful, but why it'd be good to do so. So one thing, in a way I've already said, the, the point one there is that I think it correctly locates the philosophical difficulties or the interesting issues in the questions about social status and social properties and social features rather than the sort of bringing things together. Um, the second point is one I made earlier on, when I was trying to motivate at the beginning, I said, well, at least if we think of this in terms of parts and wholes, if we think of groups of people as sort of big material objects, scattered or, or, or not, um, then it's, it, it's very straightforward for us to understand how those things can have physical properties and locations and things like that, as well as having um, more, more interesting social properties. It allows us to give a, a, a uniform metaphysical picture of, I say, a wide variety of groups of people. And what I mean there, this is something I alluded to earlier on as well, I mean, we can think about groups like just the kind of the, the people in this room or the, the people out in the street, even less organised, or, you know, a tight-knit team or a kind of complex organisation with rules and a formal constitution and so on. Not to deny that there are differences between of those things, but we don't have to say there's a kind of deep metaphysical difference that one of them is just a sum of things, whereas, one of, whereas others, others are not. We can sort of give a sort of framework in which we can understand all of those things. And likewise, actually, groups of animals, groups of artefacts. Um, if you think about, uh, well, as we have here, like a, 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 a collection of books, a museum collection, it's a kind of, it's in some sense, it's a, it's a, it's a social group, as it were, of, of, of artefacts in, in some of the same kind of interesting ways as you are a social group of people. We can, once we are happy to start thinking about parts and wholes, this is more like a sort of practical advantage, we can go and, if we've got a question about um, how to solve a puzzle about parts and wholes, you can go and look into all the metaphysics articles about, about all this that's been published in recent years. Um, and that's not just a kind of trivial point, right? There's, there's, there are really very well worked out ways now, of think different alternative ways of thinking about how do parts make a whole, how should, we, how should we think about that, how easy is that, is, how difficult is that. Um, and all of those resources are waiting there for us. If, we can, if, we, if we're happy to think about social groups in terms of parts and wholes, we can draw on that as we see fit. And fi well, five and six are really sort of sub points of four. Just to give you a couple of examples about that. Right? So do these are just ways in which we can draw on what people have thought about parts and wholes for individual objects to help us understand social groups now. So I, so I, the way I like to think about uh, the way I like to think about individual objects and par as parts and wholes is in this way that's very much inspired by David Lewis, and I've kind of summarised here under, under point five. Um, so I think it's very easy for things to to form a whole. There's just many, 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 many random gerrymandered objects, and the, the the difficult questions are which ones are we interested in, and which ones are causally coherent, and which ones do we give names to, and how does our language attach to them, that sort of thing. Um, if you took that sort of approach to the metaphysics of social groups now, you could say, well, look, there are many, 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 many social groups, right? because all it takes to have a social group in some sense is just to have uh, some people, right? and they don't even have to be the people sitting in the same room. There can be any, any, any random um, collection of people will be a social group. We don't have to worry about sort of existence questions there, but then we've got the much more interesting and tricky and, and significant questions about, well, which ones are we interested in? Which ones have... Uh, power in society, or which ones do we give names to? How, do our la how does our, la our social language attach to some of those things and not others? Um, and if, I'm happy to talk about this in discussion if people want to, and that, that may help us deal... I, one reason I like this sort of picture is it helps us deal with issues around vagueness and indeterminacy in a, in a very nice way, in my view. But if that's not your thing, if you don't like that kind of metaphysics, um, there's very, very different kind of pictures are also out there, other, other, other metaphysics are available, um, that could also help us think um, about social groups. Right? So just to take a really contrasting view, 
Um, there's a nice recent book by Simon Evelyn, which is called Making Objects and Events, A Hylomorphic Theory of Artifacts, Actions and Organisms. Uh, so, it's hylomorph so he's thinking about form and matter. So he thinks the way to think about composition, at least for living things and for artifacts, is first of all, one thinks about their function or their design or their purpose, and it's having a function that is what kind of keeps the parts together. So in an organism, the, the organism's got a sort of function and a purpose, um, and that's what, and its metabolism is kind of what keeps it together. It's the kind of coherence there. Same thing with artifacts, right? What, you've got the parts of the lectin here, but what sort of holds them together to make them a composite object in some sense is the fact that that's, that's what they're here for, is to be the parts of this lectin. So it's a very different way of thinking about parts and holes, right? Um, and it would be a whole other talk to kind of compare that sort of Lewis sort of picture with that more kind of hylomorphic picture. But if you like that sort of Evnine kind of view, and many people do, that also gives us a different sort of set of resources for thinking about social groups. So I think it's quite natural then on that picture to think of a social group as an artifact. It's something that we make, right? either intentionally or as a kind of consequence of, of other things we're doing. We might think of the principle or the kind of function of the group as in some sense what holds the people together or its design or whatever. There's, there's a, and there's, and, he, and, and Evan I and others have written extensively about how to spell out those ideas and how to think about them over time and modally and so on. So that's, I didn't argue there for Evelyn's picture or for the Lewis style picture, but I just wanted to sort of throw some of that stuff out then. Partly, if anyone's familiar with it, you, you can maybe do more with it. But just to illustrate that there are, we've got these sort of metaphysical frameworks that are sitting there waiting, and if we, for thinking about parts and holes, and if we think about uh, social groups in terms of parts and holes, we've got already got a kind of load of sort of resources and machinery we might use. Just finally then, for the last minute, um, one reason I think this is exciting and um, uh, potentially fruitful, I think one role that metaphysics can have in this area and in elsewhere is not giving us the answers and telling us about how social groups work or, or you know, how to run society, as it were, um, but it can stop us getting tangled up when we try and think about those things. Right? So I think you see this often with metaphysics. It's a, it's a way of helping us stay consistent or think clearly when we're trying to think about what is physics telling us, or in this case, what are the social sciences telling us, or what kind of society do we want to have. If we've got a sort of metaphysical framework, whichever one we choose, for thinking about this, um, that might help us think about things like migration and who belongs, who are the British people and how do we think about the British people and the European people and the people of London or um, what is it to be a citizen. There's lots of issues there which we can think about as being people being in and out of social groups. And again, I, let me stress, it's not that I think that muriology will tell you the answers to those questions, but it gives you a sort of discipline and a rigour and a framework in which one might start thinking about those things and trying to pose some of the questions. Um, and I think that's, that's something I would like to do in the future. So thanks very much.